Good afternoon. Happy Sabbath. Raiden just asked me to remind you guys that daylight savings time, saving time begins tomorrow. I used to call it summertime. Uh, but nobody calls that here. Um, yeah, it's good to see my church family. Happy Sabbath. Joseph, nobody calls me Pastor Kwan here, okay? Um, I, yes, I dislike it, so. But nobody calls me pastor here. You either call me Myung or Pastor Myung, okay? My first name is very, very important, so. So that's a reminder for my church family. Um, because I only get to see you uh, half the time, and my half time is devoted to my other church, um, I, I, before I get to my sermon, I always like to have these, these small chit-chats, just talking about this and that, so I guess I'll do that again this morning. You know, this morning I got here about 10.30, I was sitting in my office, and, uh, and Brad comes in, and uh, I get to hear my church family walking in to the hallway during church, and just listening to that, that noisy visit just makes me really happy. Seeing my church family walk into church on a beautiful Sabbath morning, uh, just coming to worship the Lord, to fellowship with one another. Um, and I think that's just, just great to see my church family get together to, to worship in the space together. So that's, that's a blessing for me this morning, I, like I said, coming here early and just trying to finish up my sermon. And just listening to my church family walk in and just have these visits, that's a great joy. I'm glad to see each one of you uh, here to, to worship the Lord. And uh, please continue to visit afterwards. And church is over, go outside and uh, visit one another in the beautiful sunshine. And uh, I think that would be great uh, to see our church family do that. Um, this is our last week of our 40 days of spiritual fasting. Um, it finishes, uh, it ends next Sabbath. And uh, I, I pray that this will be a journey uh, that is guiding you to come closer to Jesus. Oh, by the way, talk speaking of next Sabbath, please come next Sabbath. We have a wonderful speaker uh, that's going to be presenting the Word of God, Ninfa. Brother is going to present the Word of God. I've been waiting for this moment for, for months, and uh, uh, she's going to give her testimony uh, next week. So I, I invite our, our family to be present, to support her, to pray for her, and to be with her uh, as she presents the Word of God next week in our, in our Sabbath worship. And so that'd be great. Anyways, coming back to 40 days of spiritual fasting, I don't know if you felt this way, but a lot of times, 40 days of fasting, it's very, it's long, okay? I get it. I feel that way too. And there's a lot of times where I feel um, discouraged and I feel like a failure because there are certain days where I forget to commit to the things I've been promising to do for the 40 days. And I feel that you probably go through that phase again, where I feel like I'm not committed to this, where I feel like I'm not fit for this, or maybe I just want to give up. And, and I think that's where this sermon comes in, as we go into the final stretch of these 40 days of spiritual fasting. Um, this will be an encouragement for us to continue as we have committed ourselves to be followers of Christ, as we have committed ourselves to be disciples of, of Christ. And, uh, and I think that's what's going that's, that, that determination to follow Christ, uh, it will help us to come, uh, finish uh, our, our 40 days of, of spiritual fasting uh, next, next Sabbath. So let's turn to the book of Matthew. Uh, we'll go into our scripture reading, uh, chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 18, it says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. It's a very short, compact uh, passage. It doesn't give much details. It simply is told that Jesus went to these men, fishers, and said, follow me, and they followed Jesus at that very moment. But when you understand the context 
of discipleship and how a disciple is made, um, you understand the significance, the depth of what Jesus is doing to these men and how he changed their lives. Uh, the culture of the, the Jewish people, the culture of the lives of Jewish people are founded upon the writings of Moses. God gave the, uh, the first five books of the Bible. We call it the Pentateuch. But to the Jewish people, it's called the Torah. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible, it's called the Torah. And this is what shapes the Jewish nation, their culture, their lives. And, and they took it very dearly to heart. And so all the Jewish boys, when they turn uh, uh, to the age of six, they go to a nearby synagogue and start their schooling. And the school is called Beth Safir. And from the age of six to around the age of 10 or 11, they continue the education based upon the Torah. What they do in those years is they memorize the first five books of the Bible. Memorizing the whole five books, okay? That's a lot of, of training and education that goes through from the age of six. Now, you think that's impossible. Remember uh, when we were living in my previous district, Superior, uh, Sebin uh, actually memorized the whole Ten Commandments. Well, I think she was around, what, three or four years of age? And it's doable. So when you keep training over and over again, um, these Jewish boys, would memorize the whole five uh, books of, of the Torah. But of course, not all the boys stay all the way to the end. By the age of 10, a lot of, not if not most, of the boys would actually drop out of school so that they could start their apprenticeship of following the family business. So they would go back home, skating, training to follow the uh, family trade, the family business, and they start uh, being a part of of, 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 of their fa family business. So at the end, end of 10, when they're done with their training, those, as most of the boys would return back home uh, to, to help support the family, the best of the best would move on to the next school at the age of 10 or 11. It's called Beth Talmud. And the school of Beth Talmud, these boys, would start their training and memorizing the rest of the Hebrew Bible. Okay? We're talking about 39 books. They studied them, they would repeat it over and over again, and they would completely memorize the whole Old Testament. Think about that. And it's a rigorous training, very tough training, and of course, throughout that training, not all the boys that made it into the second level of, 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 uh, of training, they don't finish it. And they assume many of them will choose to follow uh, 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 in their family trade, go back and helping their parents uh, with their family business, and only the best of the best of the best remain to move on to the next level of training. And that training, that school is called Beth Midrash. Beth Midrash is where rabbis come into picture. And the rabbis are, 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 are spread out in different parts of the country, and, and now these students, the best of the best of the best, are not determined to, to be the truly trained and educated into the, the Word of God. And so they don't go into any school of Beth Midrash, and, but they look for a rabbi that they, they follow, they want to follow. And these rabbis are, are unique and significantly different from one another because at that level of training, these rabbis um, will have their own interpretation of the scripture. So, for instance, if there's a certain passage and, and a rabbi has a certain interpretation of that, other rabbis will use the same passage and will have a different interpretation of that. And these are called the yokes of the rabbis. Okay? And so, when the students come to that level of Beth Midrash, they, they study the different rabbis and say, you know what, I like the yoke of this rabbi, or I like the yoke of this rabbi, so I want to go to this particular rabbi and be trained from him. And so the student that advances to the, the Beth Midrash, they will approach the, the rabbi and say, Rabbi, I want to be schooled under you. The rabbi just, just, just doesn't say, you know what, that's fine, that's cool, come with me. He doesn't do that. He rigorously trains him or questions him 
test him over again whether this man, this young boy, is able, capable of following my education, my training. After a, a series of challenging questions and testing this young student, the rabbi says to himself, this boy is capable to be my disciple. When he thinks, when the rabbi thinks that this boy has test, uh, tra- passed the training or, or passed the test, this is what the rabbi says to the boy, come follow me. And that's where the discipleship of this young boy begins as he follows the rabbi. The rabbis, they have a business, uh, they have a very busy life of training. So they go around to different towns teaching the word of God. And because a disciple who has passed this rigorous test to become a disciple, he follows the disciple as close as he can, listening to what the, the rabbi is teaching and trying to learn as much as he can from the rabbi. And because they travel from town to town on dusty roads and the disciple is very close by to the master, the rabbi, The saying goes, may the dust be all over you as you become a disciple. Why? Because you follow close by to the master and because they walk in a dusty path and so close to uh, to the rabbi, when the rabbi walks and there's dust forming behind him, the disciple is so close by that all the dust is upon the disciple. And that's what that phrase means, may the dust be upon you. There's a similar phrase. Um, sometimes when I get so passionate in my preaching, I get so excited that spit comes out of my mouth. You know who gets it? The people in the front rows. And that's where, and that's where, there's an Asian saying that may you receive the spit of the master because you're so close, wanting to listen to the teachings of the master. So you guys are my number one disciples right now. So when Jesus comes to these, these, uh, these men, fishers of men, okay, let's go back to our passage here. It says, Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew's brother. Jesus says, come follow me. Now, we talked about the different schools, right? Beth Zephyr, Beth Tamud, Beth Midrash. You only advance when you pass, when they make the cut, but for these men, Jesus comes to them because they don't have a rabbi to follow. In other words, They didn't make it to the next level. They didn't make the cut. They're not qualified enough. They're not educated enough, or they're not intelligent enough to follow a rabbi. They didn't make the cut. And to these men, Jesus says, come follow me. Jesus came to them. And usually, it's the students that approach the uh, the rabbi and say, can you take me as your disciple? But Here, in this case, Jesus came to these men and said, come, follow me to these men who are not qualified to become a disciple. And Jesus comes to them and says, come, follow me. And I think there's something to really think about. And you know what Jesus says? Let's go to Matthew chapter 11. These are the words that Jesus says. Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, Jesus says, actually, I'll read uh, verse 28. Come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So this yoke probably has a dualistic meaning, the yoke that, that uh, uh, an ox carries in, in, carry, in, in the labor. But it's not just that yoke. The other yoke I'm talking about is the yoke of the rabbi. Remember, the rabbis had different interpretations of certain passages. They have their own thoughts, their philosophy, their training uh, uh, methods into certain passages. And Jesus says, take my yoke. He says, take the teachings of what I say and learn from me. Don't listen to others. Learn from me. And that's what Jesus is saying to the disciples. Come Follow me, take my yoke upon you. Why? Because people think you are not qualified, but I chose you, says Jesus. And that's what this all means, come follow me. And Jesus says the same thing to us, come follow me. If you think you're not qualified because you can't finish your four days of spiritual fasting, Jesus says, no, don't you worry about that. Come follow me. You know, you know, Mary, Mary told me, told, just said, you know, the pastor can handle school. And that's right, I can handle school. That's right, I can handle school. This past week alone, I spent three nights not sleeping. 
because I had to finish my paper that's due. And, and, and it's, it's a fun experience because I, 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 get, I get very hungry at night and, uh, and, and I, I started cooking uh, ramen noodles. <laughs> and uh, my wife, who's also studying upstairs, my wife is on school as well. And we don't go to sleep before like 1 or 2 a.m., okay? And so I'm, I'm cooking ramen noodles and I'm like, oh, this is going to be so good. I'm like, this is going to prepare me for the next hours of studying. And then Henry comes downstairs and says, it smells so good. Can I have a bite? She doesn't have a bite. She takes the whole half, okay? And, uh, and, and you know, it's just, it's rigorous. It's a lot. But for some reason, every time I feel like this is a challenge and I can't get over this point, I get to, to, I get to, to my Bible, and there's always a text that encourages me that I could come overcome this. And... And by morning, when I see the sunlight after all night, I'm just surprised at how much of achievement I made in writing my paper. Why? Because Jesus says, come, follow me. You don't think you're qualified. You don't know how many times I want to quit from the school right now that I'm in. But every time, every time, there's these words of hope, encouragement from either from one of you or from people around me or from the scriptures itself says you can do it. Because... Don't, don't discourage yourself. Jesus, come, follow me. There's a couple other characters I want to talk about in the scriptures as we talk about qualifications of who is qualified to become a disciple or not. And we find that in the book of Acts. Turn with me to the book of Acts. And here we go to uh, uh, this unique character that, that is mentioned in the scriptures. We know of this name, but we don't really talk about this name so much. And that man is no other than uh, Barnabas himself. Let's go to chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. And uh, this is where Barnabas comes in. You know, when we talk about the book of Acts, we talk about the miraculous, the heroic stories of, of Peter and John, of how they heal uh, people, and, and how uh, 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 Apostle Paul comes to the picture and dominates the rest of the, the, the book of Acts. But here, Barnabas is actually mentioned 23 times in the book of Acts. And his, his role is very significant on, on how he shapes the theology and the life of Paul. Okay? So let's, let's go into to Acts chapter 4, verse 23. It says, Let's go to verse 30, 32, not 23, but 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of Jesus, and great grace was upon them. Nor there was anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses, sold them, brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone has need. So by this time, by this time in the book of Acts, people were so committed to, to growing the church of Jesus that they were willing to give everything they had. They, they, they sold their lands, they sold all their possessions, and laid them as an offering to the apostles' feet so that they could use these finances for the sake of the gospel. And one of them was, verse 36, and Joseph, in other translations, his first name is actually translated Joseph, okay? And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated the son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. About, among the many people that sold all the possessions for the sake of the gospel was this man, Joseph. And he had a, a nickname. The nickname was what? Barnabas. And nicknames tell a lot about that person, right? And this nickname, and, 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 and throughout the rest of the scriptures, they don't use his first name. It's like their nickname has become their first name. And the nickname means what? Son of encouragement. And he was a Levite. Now, Levites are people who serve the temple. They were not priests, okay? But they were assigned to the task of, of serving the temple and managing the temple. And certain times they even, wouldn't even police the temple when people uh, uh, vandalized or caused trouble at the temple site. And Levites were also allowed to have possessions and lands. And Joseph here also had land, but because he was committed to the task of the gospel, you know what he does? He sells all his land. 
and gives it to the apostles for the sake of the gospel. Now, a lot of times, you know, we have this attitude and tendency, you know what, I gave my offering, I did my share, so let the pastor do all the job. That's not what Joseph does here. If you go to chapter 11, the disciples send Joseph, Barnabas, into the mission field of Antioch so that, so that he could preach the gospel. So here we have a committed man, not only to give him, uh, 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 submit himself financially, but he also devotes his life to the life of ministry. It's a very dramatic way of introducing Barnabas. Luke, the writer of uh, Acts, has a, very, has a very special way of introducing people, dramatic encounter and appearances. So this is the first mention of Barnabas, Joseph Barnabas in the scriptures, and they, they, he introduces Joseph in a very uh, heroic way. He gave everything for, for the apostle for the sake of the gospel. On the other hand, the next character I'm about to talk about has a very opposite dramatic entrance to the book of Acts. Let's go to chapter 7. In chapter 7, verse 58. I'll start with verse 57. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. They're actually about, uh, uh, talking about um, Stephen as, as the, the great deacon was uh, Faithful to Jesus, these men are now ready to stone him. Verse 58, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named who? Saul. What a dramatic introduction to this man. Saul, or Paul, who shaped the theology of the Christendom. This is how he is introduced in the Bible. What a contrast. Barnabas gave everything for Jesus. And the introduction of Saul, on the other hand, he was a part of the man who stoned Stephen, and all the clothes were laid upon his feet. You're thinking, how can these two come together? Right? Such a contrast. And we know the conversion story of Saul and how, how he became Paul. Paul. Saul was on the way to Damascus to, to martyr or actually to, to persecute the followers of Jesus, Jesus intervenes, converts him, okay? And now Saul has become a devout follower of Jesus, the man who persecuted the people of Jesus, or Jesus himself, because Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? So the man who was persecuting Jesus now becomes a devout follower of Jesus, and now he's on the front to preach the gospel to the people, but at the beginning of Saul's ministry, he's not welcome because of the reputation he had before. And we come to chapter 9. Here we have the first encounter of, of, of Saul and Barnabas. Verse 23. Actually, I'll start with verse 20. It says, immediately he preached to Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. So right after his conversion experience, Saul goes up to the front of the gospel line and says, you know what, I'm going to preach Christ. So he's so passionate, he's on fire because of the new uh, uh, encounter with Jesus. He's ready to, to preach the gospel at all the places, but he was not received well because of the reputation he had. Verse 23, now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. Why? This man betrayed us. He thought he was with us. We thought he's with us in, in persecuting the Christians, but he's not with us anymore. But also, the disciples were skeptical of him as well. So as they plot to kill Jesus, I'm sorry, uh, 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 Saul, this is what happens. Verse 24, but their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. And when the disciples, and some translations say brothers took him by night and let him down the wall in a large basket. So here, Saul dramatically uh, escapes this plot of, of, of murder, okay? Verse 26, and when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. The, the other disciples shunned Saul. They were scared. They still did not believe in him. They did not trust Saul a single bit. That man was out there to persecute our fellow brothers and sisters, and now he's preaching Christ? No way. You are not part of us anymore. Or you're, you're, you can't be a part of us. And you know who comes to the picture? The first encounter with Barnabas and Saul. Verse 27. But 
But is always a, a very important word in the scriptures, right? But, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. When you look at the, the true meaning when he says he brought, it's not just literally bringing, hey, you know what, it's okay, let's bring him in. What, what's happening here is when Barnabas is bringing him to the apostles, bringing Saul to the apostles, he's actually bringing him under his arms. The only person uh, accepted Barnabas, uh, uh, well, Saul was Barnabas. Why? Because Barnabas is a son of what? He's a son of what? He's a son of encouragement. He encourages. He believes in the potential that people has. Say, I don't know what others may be saying about you, but I believe you. I believe you. I'm going to encourage you. And so Paul is now taken on the arms of Barnabas because he trusts him. And what happens afterwards? He declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and how he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. He spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. So Paul is now accepted because of Barnabas, and uh, um, Paul actually uh, makes a statement. When you go to um, Galatians chapter 118, let's not go there uh, this morning. Galatians chapter 118, Paul tells us that his experience in Jerusalem lasted for about 15 days. So when, when he went to see the apostles, when he fled the, the, uh, the plots to kill him, uh, he, came, he comes to Jerusalem to be received by the apostles, which he wasn't received by the apostles, and later Barnabas takes him in. That experience was for about 15 days. He was there for about 15 days. So you could imagine Barnabas working with Saul as he took him under his arms, working from two, two full weeks to really nurture him, to really, to, to, to really show him that he can be accepted. When Barnabas accepted him, Paul was able to preach the gospel. But because it was still in the early stages of ministry, people still did not receive him too well. And to this, this is what happens. Verse 30, when the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. It's a very discouraging statement because what they're saying is, look, Paul, I can see your passion, but you're not ready yet. Go back home. Tarsus is where Saul is from. Saul is from Tarsus. That's his hometown, okay? So what they're saying is go back home. Barnabas took him in, and yet the rest of the community was not able to take this guy back in. And They say, go back home. You're not ready yet. It's too dangerous. Probably that's a very diplomatic way of saying it. it's a bit too dangerous for you, so go back home. But in, deep inside, maybe they were saying, you know what? You're not ready for this. You're not cut for this. Go back home. Galatians chapter uh, 2, verse 1 says that it took him 14 years for, for Paul to come back to, to uh, Jerusalem. So you can imagine how long he was back home. But this is where the second encounter with Barnabas and Paul comes in. Let's go to chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. In the meantime, in the meantime, while Saul was back home in Tarsus, this is what happens. Verse 19. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, and preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, and who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the land of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. So you could see this area of Antioch growing uh, uh, in the beliefs of Jesus. So they need someone uh, reliable, someone that they could trust in preaching the words of God. And so they sent this man. Verse 22, Then the news of things had come to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he had come, came and had seen the grace of God, and he was glad and cursed them, all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he, Barnabas, was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Very suitable description of this man, Barnabas. It says he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. 
I wish I could have this title when someone says about Pastor Myung, he's a good man. And that's what is described of Barnabas. He is a good man. And so you could tell how great of a man this man is. You know, if they say, you know what, Antioch is growing in faith, and we need someone suitable to go there and preach the gospel, that man is Barnabas. We've got to send this man. So Barnabas goes out there, but he sees that there is a challenge in, in, in preaching the, the gospel. So what happens here is verse 25, then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek who? Seek Saul. Remember, Saul is shunned out. They say, he's not cut for this. He may know a lot of Bible, but you know what? I don't think he's ready for it, so he's kicked out. So he's back home in Tarsus, and, and scholars vary how much he, he was there before he came back to Antioch. It was 14 years before he came back to Jerusalem, but uh, scholars are thinking probably about 4 to 10 years that he stayed in Tarsus until uh, uh, Barnabas came, came, for, uh, came, came for Saul. So think about the number of years as, as Saul is back home with his parents, and we do, the Bible doesn't say what he was doing. Perhaps this was a time where he really went in theologically, deep in, uh, deeply studying the Word of God. And perhaps this was a time where, where Paul's theology shaped, where he could write all the epistles in the New Testament. We don't know what has happened. But if there's one person that came to look for Saul, it was Barnabas. I wonder if Barnabas was not present in the story of Acts. I wonder if we could have the New Testament today. It was because Barnabas persistently went after Saul. That's why we see Saul of who he is today. He went from Antioch to Tarsus seeking, looking for Saul. Now, let's, uh, let's continue reading here. And he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. From Antioch to, uh, to, um, to Tarsus is about 148 miles. Today, we could drive 148 miles in, in a second. It's just no biggie. We just drive there 70 miles an hour. We'll get there in no time, right? But for Barnabas to travel on foot 148 miles just to find Saul. Now, Paul, he knew that Saul was in Tarsus, but he didn't know exactly where in, Tar in Tarsus, okay? So he travels thinking that Saul is there 148 uh, miles on foot. It's going to take him about, what, eight, nine days to, to just to find Saul. And verse 26, what does he say? It says, when he had found him, now, the author of the book of Acts is, uh, is Luke, right? Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and when, when he writes a story of, 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 of uh, uh, the Good Shepherd, finding the sheep, hunt, uh, one sheep out of 100, the, the same words are used. When the shepherd found the sheep. So you can imagine, the shepherd, when he loses that one sheep, he goes all over not knowing where the sheep is, but he's doing everything he can to, to find and spot this one lamb, okay? In the same way, the same language is used here in this verse. When he had found a meaning, Saul, Paul Barnabas had not a single clue of where he is. He only knew that he was in Tarsus. He goes all over Tarsus looking for Saul. And when he had found him, finally, he brought him back to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year, they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch for a whole year. Barnabas and Paul worked together for the sake of the gospel. And in, the, in this time of, 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 of one year, a period, you could imagine Barnabas nurturing, discipling Paul. Barnabas, a man of experience. And here Paul, fairly a younger man, probably late 20s or early 30s, being nurtured by Barnabas because Barnabas believed in him. Why? Because Barnabas is the son of encouragement. Despite what others may say of you, Barnabas says, I don't care. I see the potential you have. I see the passion you have for Jesus. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to nurture you. I'm going to disciple you was the attitude and the mindset that, uh, that Barnabas had. Now, this, this encouraging example of Barnabas is not only, it's actually found elsewhere in the Bible where we talk about John Mark. John Mark was a cousin of Barnabas, and they did mission work together uh, with, 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 with Paul and Barnabas. They all worked together. But at some point, because John Mark, being a very young man, um, he, he, I don't know, the Bible doesn't really say it, but he kind of got tired of it, okay? And uh, this is what happened. Acts chapter 13, verse 13. 
Now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John Mark, John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. As they were trying to do more mission work, John says, you know what, I'm done. I'm going to go back. And this, this kind of upset Paul. Okay? Paul is a passionate, zealous man. He's on fire for Jesus, and seeing, 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 um, seeing John Mark back out, he sees him as a backslider. Says, this kid, no discipline. And that actually brought some, some conflict between, between Barnabas and Paul. Let's go to chapter 15. Let's go to chapter 15. Verse 36. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. That's his cousin and says, you know what? I think John has a potential. I know he kind of backslided, but you know what? Let's take him in again. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to do the work. Then their contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, and but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God, and he went to Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. Now, this sounds like a very negative passage. It seems like the, the, the conflict between Barnabas and Paul is it's not a good one, but let's not, it's not what I'm going to focus on right now. I want to focus on, on Barnabas believing in, in John. You know what? He kind of backed out, but I still believe in him. I know he can do this job. So Barnabas grabs his cousin and says, let's do this. We can do this together. Now, when you think about this, it was John Mark that wrote the Gospel of Mark. If Barnabas did not believe in Mark, we would not be having four Gospels today. We'll be having only three Gospels today. But because Barnabas believed in the potential this man had, he says, I'm going to encourage him. I'm going to give him one more chance so that he could do the Gospel work for Jesus. Paul, even though he wrote a lot, a big part of the New Testament, Paul is also a human being. He's not perfect. He has his mistakes, and perhaps this could have been his mistake. And later, and later, Paul recommends Mark. Let's go to, um, let's go to, um, let's go to Colossians, Colossians chapter 4, 10, and 11. This is what Paul says of, of Mark. So later, even though Paul did not approve of John Mark in the beginning, later, John, uh, Paul approves of of, of the quality that, that, that John Mark has. Colossians chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. This is what Paul says of John. Verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. He says, you know what? I approve of this man. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, and they are only my fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are, the circum who are of the circumcision that have proved to be a comfort to me. John Mark was not a man of comfort to Paul. He was a thorn in his eyes. Man, this, this chicken, he chickened out. He did not believe in him. But when Barnabas worked and nurtured Mark, Paul now says he is a man of comfort. To me. Just right before the death of Paul, as if Paul writes, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, 11. 2 Timothy chapter 4, 11. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for my ministry. Paul now understands that this man, Mark, is now useful for ministry. Who changed him? Barnabas did. When Paul did not believe in this young man, Barnabas believed in the young man, and he took him and under his arm said, I'm going to nurture you, I'm going to disciple you. And because of that, later in ministry, Paul acknowledges what Mark is now capable of, and because of what Barnabas worked in him, Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark. We talk about Saul. We talk about Mark. People who seemed not qualified in the eyes of others, and yet Barnabas 
continued to encourage each one of them and believed in them. And I could resonate with what Jesus had done to the disciples. Come, follow me. When all other things, other people think that you're not capable, when you're not qualified, Jesus comes to each one of us and says, come, follow me. Maybe you can't memorize the whole Old Testament. Jesus says, don't worry about that. I chose you, so come, follow me. Let's go to Luke, uh, Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. Moments after Jesus feeding the 5,000, Jesus draws away to, to pray. And in the meantime, the disciples are crossing the lake. And the fierce storm is about to overtake them. Jesus comes to rescue. He walks on water to save the disciples. And when they see that it's Jesus, this is what Peter does. Verse 27, but immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me. I'm your disciple, so command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. When Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked in the water to go to Jesus, but when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, what did he doubt about? Did he doubt about Jesus? Jesus is walking on the water even as they speak. So it's not Jesus that he's doubting. You know who he doubted? He doubted himself, and that's why he sunk in the water. He says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Parenthesis, yourself. What this is teaching us is, look, Jesus says, I chose you. And because I chose you, no matter what others think of you, and if, even if you think of, of lowly yourself, uh, uh, not so capable of yourself, don't worry about it. I got you. That's why I chose you as my disciple. So don't doubt yourself. Have, have faith in me and in yourself as well, because I chose you. And that's what Jesus is saying to each one of us today. I chose you. We don't live perfect lives. I mean, in the 40 days of fasting, you know what? We could be failures. You could forget and, and, and skip. You could be discouraged with other things as well. When you say you're a devout follower of Christ, there are things that you do that could embarrass yourself and say, maybe I'm not cut for this. When you have that discouragement, Jesus says, come, follow me, take my yoke. Not the yoke of, of bondage, but yoke, the teachings of Jesus says, look, learn from me. I could teach you. I could teach you. Trust me and follow me. In the same way Barnabas had encouraged Saul in becoming Paul and the way he trained John Mark, Jesus will continue to encourage us, to lead us, so that we can be suitable in becoming a disciple of Jesus until Jesus comes again. He has given us a task, a mission, to, to, to tell the good news of Jesus to people around us. And you say to yourself, I'm not cut for this. Don't say that, because Jesus says to each one of us, come, follow me. He knows your weaknesses. He knows you're not qualified, but Jesus will make you qualified as you learn from Jesus and take Jesus' yoke upon each one of you, and may you have that faith. Do not doubt in yourself, but have faith that Jesus will carry you all the way no matter what.